Okay, hello everybody um, and welcome to the cultural panel for Surge's 14th annual China US Symposium. It's great to see you all here and I hope you're excited to learn more about um, Chinese digital media and its interesting role in China US relations. My name is Megan Starsis. I'm a sophomore here at Tufts planning to major in international relations and economics and I'm the panel lead for today's socio cultural a discussion. I'm also currently the marketing director for Tough Search. Hello, everyone. My name is Jake Rubenstein, and I'll be co-hosting with Megan today. I'm currently a freshman um, here at Tufts, majoring in international relations. We're so excited to have you all here today. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Wells, and I'll also be co-hosting this panel with Megan and Jake. I'm a first year student planning on majoring in international relations and civic studies. It's a great honor to be able to learn from the fantastic speakers we have coming up. We hope you enjoy the panel. Uh, so with that, I'm just gonna give you all some more context about what exactly we will be discussing. Um, so as China enters a new globalized era in terms of communication and social media, uh, the question of how the Chinese government will manage and engage in its evolving digital culture is a ma matter of pressing concern. Its decisions to censor and contain certain types of digital content will not only affect those in China, but also the rest of the world. Because China's cultural influence continues to expand beyond the scope of the Cinesphere, this panel will explore the multifaceted capacities of Chinese digital media platforms like Weibo and the relevant cultural implications on Chinese society, as well as the American perceptions of that media. However, the panelists here are free to discuss any aspect of this topic that they find particularly interesting. The first speaker we have today is Daria Berg from the University of St. Gallen. Although she's not able to be here to present virtually today, we will uh, be presenting her pre-recorded lecture over Zoom. She has a philosophy doctorate in Chinese studies from the University of Oxford and is chair professor of Chinese culture and society at the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. She has published extensively on Chinese literature, art, popular culture, and cultural history, including her monograph, Carnival in China, a reading of the Xing Shi Yin Yuan Zhuan. Um, some of her edited works include Reading China, Fiction, History, and the Dynamics of Discourse, The Quest for Gentility in China, and Transforming Book Culture in China. Her monograph, Women and the Literary World in Early Modern China, won the International Convention of Asia Scholars Book Prize in their 2015 Specialist Publication Accolades. Her current research explores urban culture in contemporary China, including new digital media, liter literature, art, gender, audiovisual culture, and internet culture. The second speaker we have is Bing Chun Meng from the London School of Economics. She is a professor in the Department for Media and Communications, where she directs the Master's of Sciences double degree program in Global Media and Communications with Fudan University. She is also the co-director of the LSE Fudan Global Pol Public Policy Research Center. Her research interests include gender and the media, the political economy of media industries, communication governments, governance, and comparative media studies. She has published widely on these topics in leading academic journals. From 2020 to 21, she served as a senior fellow of Global Governance Futures 2035, organized by the Global Public Policy Institute in Berlin under the sponsorship of the Bosch Foundation. Her book, The Politics of Chinese Media, Consensus and Contestation, was published by Paul Grab in early 2018. She is currently working on another monograph under contract with Columbia University Press about AI industries in China. Our final speaker is Florian Schneider from the University of Leiden. He holds a PhD from Sheffield University and is a senior university lecturer in the politics of modern China at the Leiden University Institute for Area Studies. He is the managing editor of Asiascape Digital Asia and director of the Leiden Asia Center also the author of three books. These include Staging China, The Politics of Mass Spectacle, China's Digital Nationalism, and Visual Pol Political Communication in Popular Chinese Television Series. In 2017, he was awarded the Leiden University Teaching Prize for his innovative work as an educator. His research interests include the questions of governance, political communication, and digital media in China, as well as international relations in the East Asian region. Wonderful. So the way this panel will work is after I'm done speaking, each panelist has about 10 to 15 minutes for a presentation with a slideshow and other visual tools they choose to use. 
Um, if you in the audience have any questions that come up during any of the presentations, please feel free to leave them in the chat and we'll address them after everybody is done speaking. Um, then the panelists will have a chance to address each other's remarks. I'll ask some, uh, a few guiding questions for discussion and then the last 20 minutes will be used as a Q&A. Um, so without further ado, um, we're gonna allow Professor Berg uh, to present first. So I will play her um, recorded video. Is everybody able to see this? storytelling. The Hello and welcome to my presentation on celebrity and post-socialist China as transmedia storytelling. The authors are Daria Berg uh, from the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland and George Strafella from Palaki University in Olowoz. The research area is connected to the areas of celebrity culture, creative industries and cultural entrepreneurship, women entrepreneurs and transmedia storytelling. The aim of this research is to understand celebrity culture and the cultural transformation in post-socialist China's media sphere and their socio-political implications. Research questions include how do China celebrities use the different media, social, traditional, etc., for cultural production, self-fashioning, and communication? The sources are print media, TV, visual arts, etc., web-based literature, blogs, and microblogs. The best set is an analysis of print and web-based sources and has to do with both the contents and also the frames to um, draw connections to the commercial context. Market reforms and cultural commodities um, play an important role here. Is there a return to the Republican era or even early modern China? Market principles pervade the cultural sphere in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Are there seats of a creative class? This is marginal to the system and stigmatized by intellectuals. The 11th five-year plan in 2006 said that homegrown creativity appears as an economic policy imperative. There's partial reform. Consumers and cultural entrepreneurs are between politics and the market. There are so-called social benefits. Beijing has discovered the value of the individual, creative self-expression, and grassroots energy in transforming Chinese economy and society, Jing Wang says. Consumption celebrity is an important concept in this context. Web fiction, print fiction, and non-fiction about life in the culture of consumption um, are the texts that we are looking at. The author um, of the book, The Society of Spectacle, Guy Debord, 
describes consumption celebrity. Celebrity, he says, is a key element of ban the banalization of the modern world. One example is Annie Barbé, the internet writer, um, whose real name is Li Tie. She's a best-selling novelist, a blogger, editor, and columnist, a photographer, and more recently, a Buddhist recluse who now writes writes no longer under the name Annie Babe or Annie Baby, but Qingshan, which is a Buddhist name, modeled on traditional women writers. Um, she also writes similarly in this case as authors Nian Nian and Wei Hui, who've also retreated into reclusion. The consumption celebrity finds all of her persona linked with consumption. Han Han is another example of consumption celebrity. He's a sky high school dropout who appears in the media as a multi-personality. He's a best-selling teenage novelist, a car racing champion, the world's number one blogger, pu a public intellectual trio, a singer and film director, also known as a playboy or a consumption celebrity. All his persona are linked with consumption, and he also ranks among China's top 10 best paid writers. The propaganda department's honors um, are something that we can look here and in this slide. Out of 30 per top personalities, there are only two or four women. If we look at the years 2016 to 2019, for example, the stage director Wang Chaoke, uh, the TV producer Gao Sunmei, the dance show producers um, Zhang Xian and um, Ko Yaling. Their list of personalities are praised for contribution to tourism, the local economies, and the official media, etc. Are they marginal? Above, you see images of the video blogger Papi Tiang. On the left, uh, Jin Xing, a dancer and choreographer in Davos. At the intersection of culture and cash, that's where Elizabeth Currid has placed such celebrities. The creation and conversion commercialization of cultural products, marketing, business ventures, and self-promotion play important roles here. Um, the, the celebrity has both an ideological and economic role. It is about exchanging cultural goods while adding to the menus of beliefs, mindsets, and cultural preferences from which others choose. Here, I'm referring to Joel Mokir's research. Ani Bape or Ching Shan, as I mentioned, um, is the pen name of uh, Li Jie. Um, she became famous in on the literary website on the internet, Rung Shu Xia, under the banyan tree, and she became one of the pioneers of online literature. In 1997, she published a short story, Gao Bie Wei An, a farewell to Vivian, um, under the uh, pseudonym of Annie Baby or Annie Bao Bei. She said she had no publishing connections playing around Mar, an important concept in the literature of the reform era, writing out of boredom just for fun. Around 2000, she actually changed from a web writer or a hack, a xie shou, to a more prestigious print author or zuo jia by publishing her books only in print after um, that the year 2000. She has now about 15 books and is a member of the official Chinese Writers Association. She's also active as an editor, translator, columnist, and so on. On social media, she is known uh, for her book promotion and self-fashioning as a Buddhism-inspired traveler. Um, I managed to get an interview with her, also she normally never gives interviews, so I was very happy to be able to interview her. She told me, so once I was able to get my writings published as books, I just stopped my online writings. Not only was this a successful move from online to the then more prestigious print and rebranding, it also points to the dense and complex connections between multiple traditional and digital media in today's mature media, media sphere. Another example is Xu Jing Lei, the actress, film director and producer, writer, editor and blogger. From my father and I um, to Go La La Go, there's a range of diverse characters that she impersonated and played that hint at the real life shooting lay. Transmediality as an all around creative promotional strategy has been, um, has been characterizing her career. It's not just products, but transmedia celebrity, her transmedia celebrity persona. 
that is important for her marketing and so fashioning. Uh, her shelter inside is a shooting lace, um, said a shooting lace individuality and personal life intermingles with her film rose and together create the shooting lay phenomenon. So shooting lay can also be investigated in the context of the transmedia celebrities. So here I would like to point to Umberto Eco's distinction between the empirical author, the model author, and the character and, uh, and the, or as a narrator. With transmedia strategy and the social media, for example, the illusion of contact with the author. There's a flattening of the multi-layered characters onto the identity of the author. Both sides of the cultural entrepreneur's identity are the promotion of the product and the promotion of the mindset or lifestyle. For example, a strong woman character, modern and urban lifestyle, exotic romance, and so on. Another example of a cultural entrepreneur is uh, the woman artist Cao Fei. She's a multimedia artist and international art celebrity. She won a Chinese Contemporary Art Award as Best Young Artist in 2006 and Best Artist Award in 2016. Cao Fei's art reflects on China's social cultural transformation from a detached, sometimes satirical standpoint. She wants to comment, not criticize, the New York Times reports. This points at globalization in the internet age, for example, her work on Renminbi City, and one of the themes that she uh, discusses or hints at uh, uh, um, is the alienation. On social media or Instagram, she shapes her artistic storytelling while projecting an image of a successful global artist. Here is an example from her Instagram, shining a light on Chinese workers. Rumba 1 and Rumba 2 uh, and Nomad are works commissioned and exhibited by Gucci. Cao Fei's other project was the BMW art car number 18 uh, called Unmanned, which was commissioned by BMW. It augmented reality uh, in her art and she also um, added a short film on a car. The w, uh, BMW art car number 18, which is based on the BMW M6 GT3, is inspired by the speed of racing cars and the tremendous changes of Chinese society over the past decades, she says on her website. Uh, in Taufi's case, we can see how most experimental of creative industries have broken separation between the elite, serious culture and intense commercialization and social media promotion. Most avant-garde cultural languages and darkest commentary on modern society are fully integrated in the market logics of the creative industries. To conclude, there's a relative marginalization, the commercial limelight in which these celebrities find themselves versus the lack of political cooptation. There's a complex relation between traditional and new media, such as the digital media, with regard to symbolic capital and creative activities. Transmediality appears in cultural creation or communication and the shaping of the cultural entrepreneur's public persona as a multimedia personality. Artistic experimentation appears as a function of cultural entrepreneurship. Thank you very much. Great, we are so grateful for Professor Berg's participation in this seminar, given her very busy schedule, um, a fascinating presentation as always. So again, thank you to Professor Berg. Um, now let's welcome Professor Meng, who will be presenting next. Okay, let me try to share screen first. Is it okay for you guys now? All good. All right. Well, the nice thing about doing a pre-recorded lecture is that you can make sure that you don't go over time. Um, I, I do have a tendency of talking too long though. So um, Jake, maybe you could remind me if I reach the 12, 13 minute point and then I will know when, the time to, you need. <laughs> when to wrap up. Um, so uh, my talk today is based on a project that I recently completed with two PhD students about 
the experience of Chinese overseas students during the pandemic. Um, and when Jake extended the invitation to take part in this um, symposium, I thought it's related to the overall theme of, of the panel um, in two ways. One is because the overall um, theme of the symposium has to do with China, um, US relation and, and engagement. Um, and what we did in this project is to uh, conduct in-depth interviews with students who were studying um, either in the UK or the, in, in, the, in the US during the pandemic. Um, and a lot of the questions have to do with how um, their views um, of the different political system and also their um, personal experience with xenophobia, with anti-China um, racism um, sort of shaped also their, their value during this, this time. So that's, that's one connection there. And secondly, we call this mediated um, pandemic experience also because in our interview, um, there's a large chunk of the, the, the topic guide actually asked about people's digital media usage. Because in a way, this current pandemic compared with all the previous public health crises is intensely mediated in an unprecedented way. And for overseas Chinese students, because of the prevalence um, of social media usage, um, they basically live in different media environments. So they get the mainstream media from their host country, but also they are closely monitoring and also very intensely engaged with um, social media accounts um, on WeChat, on, on Weibo, and constantly also getting message from their parents and family uh, back home. So it, in a way, it's quite a unique mediated experience for these um, Chinese students. Um, so that's, that's why I think maybe it, it, it will be relevant and interesting to talk about this project. Although I, I do realize, you know, given the nature of this symposium, I'm not, this is not exactly a, a research conference. So I'm gonna skip some of the parts that have, um, you know, focused more on the, the methodology and the research design. Um, but first, just to set the scene a little bit and, and thinking about the, the context, um, I think you know there are a few things to note here. One is the outbreak of the COVID-19 takes place at the high point of um, new liberal globalization, when both global interconnection and the backlash against it um, on various fronts have reached an unprecedented um, level. Um, already, you know, before the pandemic, there was discussion about the so-called decoupling of, of um, the U.S. and China. There was the trade war. There's also the, um, the, the, the talking about whether we are witnessing um, a, a Cold War 2.0. So it's, um, you know, really two sides of the same coin. We see in, um, unprecedented interconnection, but also there's very strong backlash against it. And economically and geopolitically, um, compared to the 2003 SARS epi epidemic, China now also occupies a very different position in the global capitalist orders. Um, and for the overseas Chinese students, as they and and I, you know, this is also partly the reason why I um, started this project. I started this project really because I was witnessing um, the kind of experience that my Chinese students were going through, especially around 2020. So in the early 2020, when China was the epic center um, and Chinese students were experiencing all the anxiety and they had to make the difficult decision about where whether they should wear masks coming to the class because at that time it's not happening, you know, it's not re really erupting in Europe yet. Um, and they were also, there was also um, very, you know, ugly racist um, attack and, and racial abuse happening in the UK in the, at the beginning of um, 2020 because Chinese students were somehow considered being, you know, infectious, contagious, or simply because they were wearing masks. Uh, but then as the Epic Center shifted, from China as things were put under control in China and then the epic center shifted to Europe and as UK went into lockdown, um, they then also experienced also intense anxiety about whether they should stay here, 
um, or um, and especially after all the teaching went online and whether they should go back home. And if they decide to go back home, is it possible to do that? Some of them bought multiple air tickets just to make sure that they can finally make the trip home. So this was really, um, you know, partly the project was really triggered by what I witnessed as, as the, 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 the struggle and the stress and anxiety that my Chinese students were going through at that time. But putting this um, you know, in, in an academic context, the questions we are asking um, in this project is what have been the lived experience of Chinese overseas students during the COVID-19 pandemic, especially in relation to racism, xenophobia, and nationalism? Um, and what are the main discrepancies and incongruencies that Chinese overseas students have to negotiate in their mediated understanding of the crisis? As I mentioned at the beginning, because you know, they are getting information from both media outlets in their host country and also from their, their home country. Um, and also because of the, the, the omnipresence of social media, um, you know, they were basically, if they choose to, they can stay online 24 seven. And I'm gonna talk about later how they then learn to manage their own media consumption as a way also to manage anxiety and, and stress. Um, and then have their assessment of the political system in, in both China and their host country in any way affected by the pandemic. And this of course is a continuation of the, the, the first research question about how you know, their, um, they, they experience um, racism, xenophobia and, and nationalism. And putting this um, in a bit of a theoretical um, context, so basically there are two sort of um, theoretical threads here. One is um, Ulrich Beck's notion of risk society and the extent to which the risk of society should mobilize a, a cosmopolitan um, cooperation and also to um, mobilize a, a cosmopolitan mindset. Um, so his argument is that, you know, as they, the anticipation of global risk could, could result in everybody, uh, an everyday global awareness among citizens of modern societies and give rise to cosmopolitan in, imperatives of cooperation. Um, so this is, you know, of course, you know, he, he, his notion of cosmopolitan imperative has both a normative and um, analytical dimension. And what we want to ask is to problematize this and ask the question to what extent or whether this has really, you know, the current global crisis um, has contributed to um, the rise of cosmopolitan imperative. And another sort of um, theoretical threat here is, is about diaspora and, and media consumption. And especially um, at this day and age of um, social media pervasiveness, um, how have the diaspora population negotiated their national identity and political allegiance? with the vocabularies and discursive resources provided um, by both you know, media from their home country and also media um, in the, the host country. Um, and you know, so based on this um, sort of deriving from these two theoretical threats, uh, we want to better understand how is the current public health risk uh, made, is made sense of by an elite group that epitomize mobility and the connectivity. And we do recognize very much the, 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 the very strong elite band in our sample, uh, because these are students um, studying in um, elite UK and, and US universities. And some of them even started their overseas education from secondary school. Um, so we are talking about a particular group that used to take mobility and connectivity for granted. And then suddenly during the pandemic, this mobility and connectivity um, are um, halted and which also prompt um, a lot of deliberation and um, uh, reconsideration. Um, and how individuals navigate the incongruence and uncertainty by piecing together um, very discursive resources in an effort to articulate a coherent um, narrative. So I'm gonna skip this um, slides uh, about the research is design, and um, but just to note that basically the topic guide um, has three 
main components, and and one of these components is asking about their daily media usage. Um, and I will also skip this slide about the the, the sample. But um, generally, we try to achieve a balance in terms of gender uh, major and also the length of study overseas. But but as you can see here. We have quite a number of interviewees who had uh, more than five years of studying. So this would um, often include part of the secondary education. And um, you know, this is a this is a quote from um, this is was an article published um, during the pandemic. Um, so the um, Columbia-based um, historian Adam Tooth. And he was saying um, that uh, Beck is, is the most important maybe sociologist that could help us understand the current crisis. And in this quote, um, in particular, um, he talked about how Beck was talking about, you know, in, in contemporary risk, a uh, global risk society, there is this almost this demand for individuals to um, acquire more knowledge, acquire more information, and to become the so-called private expert um, on a very complicated issue. So partly, um, you know, the, our interview question dealing with media usage and media consumption really highlights um, the cost of becoming the private experts on the risk of modernization, um, and in this case, um, the pandemic. Now, generally speaking, um, in terms of media literacy and the media usage uh, across the board, because of the nature of the demographic feature of this, um, this group, we see a very uh, high level of information literacy and a fairly sophisticated pattern of media consumption. Um, and often when we ask them where they get their uh, news from, they were able to make uh, this distinction between different types of um, English language news media, and they are critical of institutional media on both sides, on both the, their home country and the host country, but even more so of the mainstream um, news media in the US and the UK. Um, and I think partly this has to do with the fact that it's a given that they understand that media environment in China is heavily censored. So, but many of them said, at least when they come to study in the UK or, or in the US, they were expecting something different, but they were, many of them were bitterly disappointed during the pandemic, especially at the beginning of, of the pandemic um, because of the way that international news media reported on the situation in, in China. Um, and in terms of social media usage also, um, they demonstrate very um, you know, nuanced understanding of different types of social media platforms in terms of, you know, I go to this media platform for this type of information, but I don't go there for such and such. So I go to Xiaohongshu if I want some everyday, you know, life, daily um, life tips. But I would go to Zhihu if I want to find more reliable um, informational content. So they, they were able to, to make these um, distinctions. And this, this very, um, you know, because of the, the, the very high level of, of media literacy and information literacy, this daily curation of media consumption is often deployed as a protective mechanism to shield themselves from negative feelings such as anger, distress, or anxiety. Um, and in reality, these students experience often an acute sense of fragmentation, confusion, um, and contradiction while living abroad during the pandemic. Um, as much as um, these feelings were um, psychologically discomforting and emotionally draining, um, they also enabled um, you know, opportunities of introspection and reflection, which is um, sort of the, the, the second part of our, um, the result of our data analysis. So we call it the, the personal is, is political. So, you know, in the meantime, as they experience anxiety, trauma, um, and, and, and all this, um, you know, the, the, the stress, 
there was also a sense of political awakening. Um, and this happened, of course, not just during the pandemic. Some of them said it happened after they leave mainland China. Um, and one of the, the, the interviews said here, um, you know, when I was in China, I was discouraged to, to talk about political issues. But when I was studying in Hong Kong, I suddenly realized that I am part of the political discussion of other people. So there's no way for me even to escape this, this discussion. Um, they also um, feeling, there is also you know, a sense of feeling stuck in an increasingly polarized world in the sense that they feel that they are constantly compelled um, or demanded to take sides. Um, and often they say, you know, the, the issue is more complicated. I don't always want just what want to, to take sides, but I'm you know, called upon all the time to do that. Um, and they, as a coping strategy, they try to separate the political from the personal. But of course, this is not always possible. Um, and actually in the article, um, probably this is a very long quote, you won't be able to, to read through it um, given the limited time. But in the article, we had a, quite a few lengthy um, original quotes from interview transcripts is when our interviewees uh, really open up and talk about their personal experience with, um, with race with uh, with class and sometimes also this experience is also relate um, closely connected with their um, the, the intimate relationship that they went through. So you know partly as a because we are talking again um, talking about an elite group who have very high level of cognitive capacity. So in the middle of this kind of confusion um, and the, um, you know, the, the stress, there is also a conscious effort trying to articulate um, a counter hegemonic discourse, trying to, trying to make sense of all this and trying to also make sense of the discrepancy and the um, incongruence that they went through after leaving China and after going through the pandemic. Um, so we were able to thematize um, what uh, we call four types of counter hegemonic discourses. Um, the first one is the, you know, at the most surface level, the criticism of the political system in the US or the, uh, the, the, the UK. Um, and the, um, you know, the, also the shifting boundary of multiple identities. Um, and this is related to what I said earlier about this discontent with the imperative of taking sides in, in a polarized world. And um, the, the four types of um, counter hegemonic discourses we identified, um, there's, a, there's a tiny slice among all our um, 45 um, interviews, there was actually one vocal Trump supporter. Um, and he was able to articulate a, 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 you know, a reason for, for, for being that. Um, and he was also very much aware that he said, you know, I'm probably in the minority and I don't always tell my friends that I support um, Trump. Um, and there's also another, a second type which has is, is also more or less in the minority among our interviewees, but um, is of larger number than the first one, that those are the people who uh, were able to link um, the racial problem and racial tension in the US or the UK with the class issue. And sometimes they say, you know, this, this it's not about race, it's about class. And, and they, were actually able to claim that I will actually, now I'm rediscovering Marx, that even though I was sort of indoctrinated in my middle-class politics um, you know, textbook back in China, and I never liked it, and suddenly now I'm rediscovering. So, so th that's, that's the second um, type of counter-hegemonic discourse. And the third one is what we call the statist developmentalism, 
um, people. And this is probably, I would say, more in the major, more or less in the majority. And this is also the group that has the strongest the nationalist um, tendency in the sense that the way they evaluate different political systems is based on economic growth um, and the ability to govern or the efficiency to govern. So in that you know, regard, when they compare the, um, you know, the, the efforts, the government-led efforts against the pandemic, it's quite clear for them you know, which, which side or which system is, is better. But there's also another, I would say probably um, also in, in the minority, um, an articulation of or more of a social democratic value. Those are the people who were questioning this developmentalism mindset. Um, and um, some of them were even saying that, I don't understand how people in China nowadays can evaluate everything based on economic development. That's just insane. So, so these are the people who are questioning whether a good society requires more than the efficiency of governance and economic growth. But they are also very critical of um, the, the new liberalism in, that the witness, they witnessed in um, US and the, the UK. Um, so in, in conclusion, I know I'm going over time. <laughs> um, we, we would um, conclude that leaving China has been an en enabling and empowering experience, but um, returning for many of them when they, we ask about their longer term plan, um, returning is an, an increasingly desirable option for many. Um, and the pandemic serves as a prism through which overseas Chinese students reflect on a host of interesting intersecting issues, including race, national identity, and ide ideological affiliation. Um, and the elite population has more resources, um, undoubtedly, including the capacity of buying multiple tickets just to make sure that they can eventually travel back home. And these are definitely privileges. Both the, they have the, both the material and the intellectual privilege in mitigating the global uh, risk. Um, but they are also experiencing, and some of them were already able to articulate the frustration with um, neoliberal glo globalization and their uh, very critical comments on liberal democracy. So I think it remains an open question. If we think about, you know, these are the people who are going to occupy, um, you know, important positions in the future and think about the sort of longer term um, implication of, of this experience. I think um, a lot of the issues remain open-ended, um, depending on you know, how they, they, the, the, their trajectories develop. But um, this is the gist of our study. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Professor Meng. We really appreciate it. That was a fantastic presentation. Our final speaker will be Professor Schneider from the University of Leiden. Um, you may go ahead and share your screen. All right, well, let me go ahead and uh, see if you can see this, my uh, Prezi here, I'm gonna switch to full screen. Uh, yeah, so let me uh, switch to a topic uh, that is slightly different from what we've heard so far. I think you're gonna notice a whole lot of connections in a moment. I'll try to stick to 15 minutes. Uh, I myself work mostly on digital nationalism, but today I wanted to reflect a little bit more broadly about what happens when people come together online, what kind of community formations we see coming together and what that has to do with politics, specifically uh, in the cases where the community sentiments turn into a kind of tribalism, the sort of thing that you do indeed see in nationalist movements. So just to get us started, I wanted to uh, create a little bit of a connection uh, to politics more broadly and to give you a, a brief rundown of why looking at popular culture at uh, subculture groups uh, might have something to do with politics and i'm going to start us off with the us uh, so that you have that connection and then you'll see in a moment uh, what we might uncover in the chinese instances uh, so uh, this is just a, a brief relationship diagram here from the 2014 uh, infamous gamergate case i don't I'm, you know the age that you might know this right so um in 2014, there was this uh, moment where um, right-wing gamers were criticizing women in gaming and gaming in the gaming industry, uh, designers and journalists under the guise of trying to criticize 
game journalism and supposedly the corruption happening in gaming journalism. But it was really just a misogynist uh, rant uh, against women in gaming uh, to the extent that a lot of women were receiving death threats. Uh, you can see this here at the bottom, uh, threats, threats of rape uh, was absolutely horrific. Uh, and it was um, at the time by a lot of gamers brushed away as, oh yeah, it's just either boys being boys or it's just, it's just games. And uh, a lot of people were, if they weren't in the gaming industry and, and plugged in with uh, cultures and subcultures, uh, weren't really paying a whole lot of attention to this, but they should because as uh, subsequent uh, research and especially investigative journalism has shown, a lot of the themes uh, that have come up in that 2014 movement directly informed other right-wing themes and connected with groups like the so-called alt-right or the incel movement. Uh, if you're not familiar, the people who think, the men who think uh, that their inability to find a sexual partner is somehow involuntary and is caused by evil women who are all inferior to men, so an absolutely misogynist uh, group of people. Um, some even qualify them now as a terrorist movement uh, because they're out to murder women. Uh, and then there's the MAGA movement, which has an interesting intersection with uh, some of these groups as well. Uh, and in all of that, provides a foundation of uh, right-wing discourses and practices uh, and cultural themes uh, that all provide the feeding ground for what we've seen most recently. Uh, and that is not to say that the Gamergate people are the same people who are here in this uh, picture, Stormy the Capital, uh, but just to say that they have provided much of the foundation that then later, in terms of discourses, symbols, uh, practice, and so on, uh, lived on in these other more egregious contexts, or, or similarly egregious, but now very, very political contexts. Now let's turn to the Chinese case, uh, where fandom practices are, uh, in some cases, even more extreme than what you see in Europe or America. I mean, fan uh, groups are uh, often very emotional and engaged and um, uh, yeah, often also very activist uh, all around the world. But in China, uh, these dynamics often take on a whole new dimension. And a good example is what happened in 2020. I don't know if you're familiar uh, with uh, Xiao Zhan, who's a famous uh, actor, soap opera actor, really. Uh, he was in a TV series called The Untamed, which had homoerotic uh, undertones uh, and was a big hit. And so a lot of his fans started writing gay fan fiction about him and about his character uh, on Archive of Our Own, which is a fan fiction uh, website. And another group of his fans got so upset with this because they didn't want uh, their icon to have this gay label uh, that they uh, petitioned the government and agitated against Archive of Our Own until the CCP uh, shut down access from within China to this uh, resource for cultural production. And so the Archive of Our Own folks were infuriated and there was a backlash calling for a boycott of the actor um, and of the boycott of all the brands he was associated with doing significant amount of damage and was really just a, a toxic uh, slugfest between these two groups of fans uh, over who owned the symbol of Xiao Zhan and what it should mean. And there's so much to unpack, I don't have enough time to unwrap at all uh, in terms of the political economy in China and how all of this uh, works, but what I wanted to draw attention to you here uh, is how some of the practices that we see on display here have been on uh, display also much earlier and in uh, all across uh, cultural forums in China when fandoms uh, emerge and how that can be connected to politics and, for example, also to nationalism. So my question here I want to uh, discuss with you is how do digital media interact with tribalism in China and with these kind of community sentiments. Um, I myself, as I said, work a lot on nationalism. So you also see the nationalism then spilling into the streets, for example, when uh, diaspora students, in this case in London, uh, protest. Um, this was uh, on uh, Hong Kong. And uh, we've heard uh, from Professor Meng uh, the, the complexities of how people try to come to grips with their Chineseness in often quite hostile environments. But a lot of that is also underscored by uh, activities online. And here's another example. This is a uh, yeah, satire, I suppose, rather tasteless one uh, that appeared in a Danish broadsheet at the start of the pandemic, which uh, cast the uh, PRC's national flag as uh, on these viral particles. This did not go over well with a lot of people, um, especially, of course, people from the PRC. Uh, the uh, ambassador uh, to Denmark, the Chinese ambassador, even wrote a uh, follow-up piece in which he was... Uh, yeah, uh, attacking essentially the Danish people uh, for having hurt the Chinese people's feeling. Yeah, you have to always imagine the scare quotes I'm putting in here. Yeah? Uh, so that's already quite interesting that state active uh, state officials would get involved and have opinions on this and voice them. But of course, the cultural sphere was very quickly ablaze with retaliation with Chinese uh, 
uh, internet users creating memes and mocking uh, the Danes and using the Danish flag in, in various uh, more or less uh, offensive ways to drive home their point. Uh, but then there was a backlash to the backlash as well, especially among people from uh, Taiwan, from Hong Kong, uh, people who are critical of the PRC who picked up the original symbolism of the flag and the viral particles and then reproduced it in all sorts of other cultural products. This is a video game that was very briefly available in April 2020 on the Steam platform. Very simple game really, but um, yeah, offensive, racist really, uh, pretending or, or making you pretend that you are uh, murdering all the evil Chinese zombie folks who are trying to leave the PRC to spread the virus. I'm, I don't know why, how it fits that you are playing the virus, uh, but yes, that's that was the premise and it got pulled uh, relatively quickly because it uh, doesn't meet the, the platform criteria, uh, but I have also looked at the discussions around that game and the comment sections while it was still available, and you very quickly see these entrenched groups uh, forming, each defending its own side, not really having any conversation uh, with each other, and you know, what does that remind us of? Uh, so overall, these kind of fan practices are important because they already establish a, a set of, uh, of strategies, of tactics, of how to behave online, how to agitate, and how to achieve things. That includes doxing people, so identifying who is doing things online and identifying where they are available in the real world for retaliation, bullying people, cyberbullying, informing on people in um, sensitive contexts so that their employees, uh, that their employers might punish them as employees, uh, or um, drowning out opposition, or sometimes called the water army, and we can talk a little bit more also about the 50 cent army, the more official uh, people who are going online to defend the PRC, but there's a lot of voluntary defenders as well. And they use a lot of these strategies that people have developed in fandom communities. Now, I want to say uh, a thing too about uh, really three factors that I think drive how these kind of dynamics can turn especially toxic, how they congeal into communities and what that might mean, not just in China, but also for the rest of us, um, both in terms of how um, maybe people in the US uh, deal with uh, Chinese online culture and interact with it, but also how we might deal with our own internet cultures in various different places. So let me just, uh, so three, three points, one is technology, one is political economy, and one is the state. Let me start with technology. Uh, and just point out to you that communities are pretty much always constructed, right? They're often imagined. Uh, when we see and know people face to face, uh, that has a very specific dynamic. But as soon as we're talking about people who you don't all know, all communities are imagined, whether it's, you know, all the, all the students at Tufts University, you don't know everyone, right? That's an imagined community. Uh, but so are nations, uh, so are fan groups. Uh, so they already have something in common. They really exist because people are circulating symbols and engaging in rituals with each other that are recognizable to others. And that creates this uh, illusion really in people's minds that they all have something in common. And that illusion can become real because people are able to leverage it and mobilize around it in certain uh, moments and under certain conditions. What's important when people share uh, these discourses, these symbols, uh, is that they're using media. And so the medium matters as a delivery mechanism. So I'm always reminded of Marshall McLuhan's famous dictum that the medium is the message. Uh, it matters that something happens uh, in social media rather than just in the newspaper or on television. The technology uh, has its own affordances that it enables. So um, this is another famous historian of technology who said that technology is neither good nor bad. So we should be careful with technological determinism but it's also not neutral, right? Design matters. We design things for certain purposes and the way something is designed like Facebook, the fact that you can have a angry button or sad button changes the dynamic of a conversation compared to if you only had like buttons, for instance, right? And so that is true for technology all around and certainly also in the Chinese context. This is an example for me studying uh, Sino-Japanese relations and how they played out, especially in 2012 when there was a major dispute between the two countries and I was looking at uh, issues in the East China Sea as one of my cases, the Diaoyu Islands in China, uh, Senkaku Islands in Japan. And if you put Diaoyu Islands into um, Baidu, which is the Chinese search engine comparable in a way to Google in terms of uh, certainly its market share, it's very uh, influential. If you put uh, Diaoyu Dao into the search engine, what comes up among other things is um, a widget that shows you the weather on these rocks which doesn't make any sense because you cannot go there. It doesn't matter other than to maybe some fishermen what the weather there might be like. And even the fishermen might have trouble um, going to those waters considering their controversial nature. And yet you get the impression here that it's just a place just like Shanghai or Beijing. It goes even a little bit further uh, by the actual website, Chinese weather, 
uh, logging this as uh, the Diaoyu Islands China. If you speak Chinese, you can see here that the autocomplete automatically adds this as China. Uh, and it even uh, registers the Diaoyu Islands as a city district, bizarrely, uh, in Fujian province, which makes very little sense. Uh, but this tells you already a little bit about how seemingly banal uh, little choices, which are informed by a combination of social interaction and technological interaction, someone inputting something, algorithms doing the rest, creates an impression uh, that people may not even notice is quite political. Here's another example, uh, a little bit older one from 2010, uh, but you see comments like this uh, on the internet, of course, and on all internets all the time. Um, this is a uh, hate comment by someone um, commenting on the on a, uh, newspaper article on the Nanjing massacre uh, and writing that you know anyone uh, who kills a Japanese person will receive a, a thousand RMB, you know, once this person has some money. And then it just says, kill, 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 uh, over and over. So I'm, I'm not showing you this to imply that everyone on China's internet produces this kind of garbage. That's not the case. Uh, this might just be a quite exceptional comment in many ways. But when uh, these kind of discourses emerge, they sometimes float to the top uh, of algorithmically governed um, platforms, as is the case here. You can see on the top right a red stamp. And even if you don't uh, read Chinese, you can see this must be important. Uh, it means a particularly popular uh, response to that article. Uh, and that comes up because people have liked it and interacted with it, shared it and commented on this comment enough for it to move to the front. And so, uh, you know, of course, these popularity mechanisms that you also see on other platforms like Reddit and so on, uh, that uh, then also produce uh, the impression that some things that might not even be worth of much attention uh, are actually representative and important. Uh, a final example here technologically uh, is Billy Billy. This is a video sharing uh, and uh, streaming platform, which has this uh, special feature where you comment or can comment on the video in the video itself, or sort of across the video, which is called the bullet commentary or bullet curtain. Uh, and I did a study on uh, bullet curtain commentary on videos that dealt with COVID at the beginning of the pandemic during the Wuhan lockdown. And one of the things that I found was that these comments often uh, are almost like people just leaving the note, you know, I, I've been here. Um, it's asynchronous, by the way. So you leave a comment and weeks later, people will st still see that comment together with all the other comments. But they also then sort of start merging uh, into a conform message where people start uh, commenting in the same manner because they presumably uh, assume that this is expected. This is the correct way uh, to write about things. So you can see in these videos that people frequently use phrases like uh, go Wuhan, go China, right? Zhongguo uh, Jiaoyo, Wuhan Jiaoyo, this is sort of a classic uh, comment at that time. Uh, and similar uh, phrases, recurring phrases that mark them both as uh, all being part of a similar um, community with a repertoire of signs and language. Uh, but also that signal uh, to others, you know, I, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'm getting active here, uh, even though it's probably mostly clicktivism, uh, as it's sometimes called, uh, but I'm, I'm interacting with these uh, materials in the appropriate manner. Whereas other people who might have criticism or, uh, you know, have, have more nuanced views, don't find necessarily the space in this forum on this format uh, to voice them, or they stay silent because they're worried about not um, you know, offending the, the, the mainstream in these instances. So I've called that viral villages. I refer to networks of social technical engagement that generate um, recursive feedback loops in which these various kinds of people share their community sentiment and it becomes amplified and amplified through these algorithmic mechanisms. Uh, and I use the word village, uh, viral village, because I'm again, I'm, I like Marshall McLuhan on what he wrote about villages. Uh, he used the term global village and coined it, but he didn't mean what people often mean, which is sort of a cosmopolitan, wonderful world where we're all closer together. He meant this, when people get close together, they get more and more savage, impatient with each other. Village people aren't that much in love with each other. And the global village is a place of very arduous interfaces and very abrasive situations. And so you can probably see why I have this quote here. This is from 1977. And I think Marshall McLuhan would have recognized many of what we're, much of what we're going through in that context. Now I'm pretty much out of time, but I just wanted to point out beyond the technological level, uh, the state level, the way that uh, nationalism and techno-nationalism on this Chinese state side and the Communist Party side is creating a context in which national discourses and that kind of tribalism that they breed uh, are a logical uh, response to politics and to international affairs, even though the Communist Party has a very specific understanding of what it thinks patriotism means compared to what people in China mean, and then also many, many different nationalisms in China emerge. But there is already an infrastructure that pushes a particular kind of national 
uh, and nationalist narrative and perspective in China. Uh, and then there is the commodification, the political economy, uh, the, the uh, digital capitalism, really, that uh, fuels these various platforms. Just one image, a uh, trigger warning. This is uh, uh, pornography and um, some violence as well. Uh, these are images from a supposedly a military history picture archive, uh, but it's mostly porn, snuff film, um, really nasty stuff in many ways. Uh, which sits alongside political commentary and discussion of uh, Sino-Japanese relations. And that is because the people who run a platform like this notice that people click this stuff. And so that's what gives them money, well, what makes the money. And the algorithm feeds back into it, uh, signaling to the makers that this is something that is lucrative. And so they produce more and more racy content. Uh, and it kind of spirals out of control, regardless of what the people who make the content might think about it, or what even uh, the viewers and the people who click on it think about it. We don't really know. Uh, but it creates a context in which discourse becomes more and more toxic. So uh, let me just conclude very briefly here by uh, telling you why any of this matters. It matters because these guys think it matters, right? Uh, so legitimacy concerns are at the top of what the Chinese Communist Party has to worry about domestically to assure social stability. Um, the uh, party monitors uh, big data, social media data. Bizarrely, it has sort of a dual track goal. On the one hand, it's trying to guide public opinion on social media. At the same time, it is trying to measure public opinion on uh, Weibo, for instance, in order to inform politics, uh, create five-year plans that are responsive to the audience and so on. Uh, but that means that they're basically measuring something of their own creation. And that also means that some of the problems I've just outlined now might feed back into policymaking choices by convincing politicians that the nationalists might be more influential than they actually are and making choices that are more radically, say, anti-Western, anti-American, anti-anything else really, and more um, domestically oriented uh, than might be uh, good from a more cosmopolitan perspective. Uh, and so in the end, we have a construction of a sense of homeland uh, as an existential problem, whether it's during uh, political crises, whether it's during pandemics, that combine the human psychology of what people do online with technological design, uh, the state's position and commercial rationales. And that uh, then gets feed, fed back through various other groups as they challenge these narratives and create more conflict. Uh, I can say more about the uh, Milk Tea Alliance if we have time in the, in the section uh, in the Q&A in a moment. But essentially what emerges here is um, a nationalism or various forms of nationalism that are despite or attempts uh, to the contrary, not under anyone's control, also not the CCPs. So I'm going to conclude here, looking forward to your, your questions and comments. Uh, and yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Schneider. That was really amazing. Um, so now we'll open up the floor to anybody in the audience who wants to ask a specific question, um, or if the panelists themselves would like to address each other's presentations, anything they find interesting, we can also do that. Um, so yeah, leave any and all questions in the chat. People are a little bit scared to ask a question. I do have one for Professor Mung in a moment, but uh, well, maybe we'll give our, our participants a chance first, right? I'll, um, I'll give a, a general question to start. Um, Professor Schneider and Mung, feel free to um, answer as you see fit. Um, China is, is uh, very actively digitizing many aspects of everyday life, arguably at a greater pace than the United States. Um, what kind of social consequences does this um, rapid development in technology and government-sponsored um, acceleration of these things. Um, what sort of consequences and implications does that have on the public and the government's relation to the public as well? Bing Chun, you want to get, get started? <laughs> sure. Um, well, I, I guess... Um, I'll, I'll mention maybe two aspects. Um, one is that um, they, I, I think this kind of very aggressive rolling out of digital technology and digital infrastructure is part and parcel of this state-led development, developmentalism mentality. And I think it also helps to reinforce that mentality. And, and I see that also in some of my interviews for that, for that study. 
Um, and it certainly also helps to, because it's all part of that discourse, um, it helps reinforcing um, the, the legitimacy in the sense that um, the legitimacy comes from development, come from technological superiority. And what we see is, is that increasingly now when Chinese people traveling overseas, they would initially be startled uh, at the backwardness of digital infrastructure, I think, especially in Europe, <laughs> I think in, in the UK, for example. Um, so that certainly is part of this developmentalism mentality that, that uh, adds to the, 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 the legitimacy. Um, and it gives a sense of pride and, and superiority. But on the, on the other, on the social side, um, what I see as a very sort of under discussed um, negative consequence of this is the kind of exclusion this creates. And we see this very clearly during the pandemic when the, the QR code, the QR health code was rolling out for the old folks who don't really know how to use smartphone or who don't want to use smartphone, especially when they are um, you know, go, going out, it becomes a real issue. So as you roll out this and, and the, as you lay this out as the daily informational infrastructure, you are also basically setting up um, the, the, the digital barriers, um, barriers that make it um, difficult for the underprivileged, for the more marginalized group to enjoy the full service. Um, and this is, of course, you know, it, it's not something new, we've been talking about digital divide. But in China, I think this become particularly acute because you know, now your everyday life relies on how much of your everyday activities are is now re, you know, being conducted on WeChat. It's, it's, it's being taken for granted, but it's being taken for granted who have the resource and the capacity to do that, but not for everyone. So, and, and then, when at the moment, like the, the, the pandemic, you do see the negative um, exclusive, you know, the negative consequence of this. Yeah, I can only second that. Um, my, my, I had a note <laughs> on what my colleague here around the corner at Utrecht University, Ingrid Hoft, calls uh, speed elites. Uh, so only very specific groups of people are actually uh, in the position to make the most use of digital technology. And that's certainly the case in this, at this rapid pace in China. Um, so you have urban audiences who are very good at this, not everyone, of course, in, in urban centers, but it's a very different story in rural areas. Um, and also the, um, the, the rollout of digital technology interacts with uh, capitalist ambitions in a very interesting and, and often very worrying way, uh, pushing people uh, to follow a highly individualist life. I find it quite interesting how Chinese students in the UK are commenting on individualism in the UK. They're not wrong. Uh, but there's so much individualism in China as well when it comes to elbows out and I have to be on top um, uh, to the point where um, you see the, the streamer culture, video streaming, people trying to make money off that. Uh, only the, the smallest amount of people can ever live off that. And there's a long tail of people, uh, my colleague Zhang Ge has written on this, uh, who are just in front of their camera streaming their entire lives from morning to evening and have zero views or one view, right? Uh, and they're hoping to at some point maybe make a buck off it. Uh, it's it's incredibly depressing. So you have a, an entire a large group of society that is switched off and that's going to be a serious problem. Uh, and you have dynamics uh, in which it's easy to make a big, uh, a quick buck uh, by uh, exploiting people and by uh, scamming them. And so that's something that a lot of people outside of China don't always see. I don't want to defend the Communist Party's online regulation. Right? I have a lot of problems with it. Uh, but uh, a lot of it is not informed just by the attempt to keep uh, political oppositions quiet or, or uh, shut down the activists and so on. It's often a direct response by gra from, uh, for grassroots uh, initiatives and grassroots pushes from the uh, public to say, you know, I as an urban middle class person am not safe shopping online. Uh, I get scammed. You have to do something, right? Or here's all these celebrities. Um, and these celebrities are cashing in in weird ways or uh, spreading body shaming images and do something about it. Uh, that is, these are concerns, also the sort of misinformation, fake news concerns that we all recognize uh, across the globe and that the Communist Party is also acting on. It just so happens that it then also happens to be one of the biggest spread of disinformation on the planet uh, on top of everything else, right? But there's, so this is a very complicated dynamic and I think it reveals some of the contradictions uh, that you see emerging in digital capitalism. 
Great, thank you so much for those insights. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. So the first one comes from Michelle Lin, and she says, a question for uh, Dr. Schneider, would you say China's internet controls or interests are threatening the liberal world order? Oh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I have my problems with the threat stories. Um, I, I like Professor Meng's uh, comments on Ulrich Beck and on risk. I think that's a much better way to understand uh, how, how our world works and there are actors in our world that create risks for others. Uh, it's certainly the case that we see the Communist Party rolling out a, a campaign to influence public opinion abroad and to become active for its own gains. Uh, actually, I think in many cases, that's not that different from what other uh, countries do necessarily, um, but it is often illiberal. So I can see how liberals would be worried. And we see, for example, uh, this is documented, uh, Chinese uh, often official um, actors intervening in Taiwan, for instance, in order to undermine democratic processes there, or doing similar things in Hong Kong also to shut down discussion. Uh, so there is a concern. But I'm also concerned about that narrative about threat, which is so old and, and so tried. Uh, I think it creates a self-fulfilling prophecy in which uh, a lot of Chinese actors feel the need uh, to step up the more aggressive, uh, hawkish uh, aspects of their policies uh, in response uh, to what they see as a uh, antagonistic, quote unquote, West. Uh, because China is not monolithic. It's not just one actor. It's many, many different ministries and organizations that all have different interests. Uh, and it's, I think, a question also for people in Europe or America, who are we empowering with our own responses? Who is served by a trade war, for instance, or by uh, shutting down certain technology companies uh, abroad and so on? Uh, and I'm a bit worried that it steps on the agenda of more liberal minded potential allies in China uh, and empowers the people who are maybe closer to the PLA or the uh, domestic ministries that mainly care about domestic status development, rather than, say, foreign ministry people who are much more liberal. Uh, so I, I hesitate, uh, um, as a good academic, I would question the question <laughs> in that sense, not to step on Michelle's, uh, indeed, very, very good question, uh, but just as a little bit of a warning on how we frame these kind of issues. I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, so we have um, just one more question. Um, this is from, uh, we can do like two, two more if we have time, if you just want to. Uh, quickly touch on these. Um, one is from Artem. Um, how has Chinese state media and censorship responded to the public's interest in Russian in the Re Russian invasion in Ukraine? Inchun, you want to start us off? With um, that? Yeah, that's um, that's an interesting question. I I I I don't think I've witnessed a lot of examples of censoring in this particular case because if you think about the timing of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That coincided with the COVID situation getting out of control in Shanghai. So I think it's fairly easy for you to draw the conclusion which one gets much more attention from the sensor, which is that it is deemed as, you know, they need um, much closer management and, and monitoring. Um, so I, you know, at least I haven't really but um, witness it, um, the, 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 the censoring um, of this case. But I would also make two observations. One is that in terms of the state media, it has been sticking to the official, you know, foreign ministry sort of um, spokesperson official line saying that uh, we are against any war, um, any um, invasion. Um, we don't think um, any for any country in just for the sake of securing their border, they could uh, wage a war. And we stick to the, you know, we we are we have concern uh, with uh, people in in Ukraine. And and but of course, you know, as everyone know, what happened during the uh, before the Winter Olympics, sort of this special sort of alliance being declared. Um, so, so I think the official media have been walking a very tight line here, trying to not offend both either Ukraine or Russia. Both are important partners to 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 China. Um, but on the other hand, I think interestingly on social media, though, the range of view is quite diverse. That we see people saying that, uh, you know. Uh, calling for the separation, you know, we need to we need to 
get clear with with Russia. We we shouldn't maintain this special um, um, relationship, and that was by a quite a high profile academic international relation. But then on the other hand, of course, there are people saying that um, this war the, the 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 it's because of the expansion of NATO. It's because of the U.S. So Russia was only responding to that, and and there was also a lot of support and and. There's also, of course, as you can imagine, the energy between the, the situation in, in Taiwan. So I would say generally, you know, the official media has been sort of controlling the narrative quite um, carefully, but there's a, a diverse um, view on, on social media. Yeah, I mean, if you're interested in this, uh, I don't think it's published yet, but uh, our colleague uh, Jennifer Pan at Stanford University is uh, doing research on this with a team of people. And she's been tweeting about it, so I can only repeat what she said, which is that there's about about 50% of the Weibo tweets that they've been analyzing are pro-Russian and produce this kind of misinformation that we're familiar with also from Russian television, from RT. Uh, but the rest of the commentators fall somewhere along all sorts of diverse spectrums, uh, including liberals and critics and so on. Um, so it's, it is indeed um, uh, quite complicated also on the Chinese internet. Um, I am a little bit worried about how much disinformation is circulating, though, uh, but that is not just the case in China. You also see this in Europe. I think 40 percent of people in Greece uh, are supporters of Putin. I mean, that is that shocking. In the Netherlands, it's 15 percent. I find that shocking already, but 40 percent. So we don't have to point to Russia to say, you know, add to China, say 50 well, percent. Yeah, it's not that different than other places sometimes. Right? Thank you uh, so much. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, if Professor Meng and Professor Schneider have time for one more question, um, there is one from uh, Dr. Strafella, who co-authored uh, the speech that Daria Berg gave today. Um, I know that we're over time. It's about 2.50 p.m. Uh, here in Boston. Um, would you like to stay behind for one more question? I'm happy to stay a moment. Yeah, sure, no worries. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so the question goes, when researching online culture in China or elsewhere, how do we deal with comments like the one you mentioned, which is highlighted by the algorithm, but not otherwise representative in our analysis of the culture as a whole? This is yeah. for Dr. Schneider. Um, I, like Goffman, the sociologist, anthropologist, right? Uh, and the idea of the front stage and the backstage, I find it very important to distinguish these two things. There's a um, public facing, communication element that we can analyze, but we're really just analyzing discourses. We're analyzing the resources, the statements, the symbols that are available to people and that they reuse in visible ways. We're, we're observing something people do. We're never observing what people think. We, we don't have no idea what people think. Um, and we're also not observing what people do in their private home. You know, well, what do they take home uh, from these comments. We don't know who's behind this comment. Maybe they ate something bad and posted it then. You know, we don't know what the people thought who were liking it or interacting with it. Uh, so I, I always make sure to have additional caveats in place uh, to assure that we're not um, insinuating that we're actually studying public opinion, like real public opinion. Uh, sadly, I, I'm not so sure the Chinese government is always doing that because I think there's people there who do think they are studying public opinion by looking at big data, uh, which is never the whole story. Uh, so in that sense, it's I think it's important because of the way um, these non-representative but very visible uh, shouts and screams that we see online affect uh, the discussion, how they can push uh, political decisions. Uh, we see this in cases with the uh, Xiaojan uh, example. There were other cases with um, a Taiwanese pop star uh, where it was basically became an international row because uh, she had a Taiwanese flag in a little video uh, and she got criticized extensively. And so you see these online um, debates uh, and suddenly the, the polls for um, Tsai Ing-wen in Taiwan go up by a couple of points because Taiwanese people are so angry that this pop star is forced to make an apology. Uh, so words have, have consequences, right? Uh, even if we don't know who, um, who's making them. But we should be careful about what happens on the backstage um, I'm always reminded of some very good scholarship on the Soviet Union. Um, right before it fell, all the Russian experts, the vast majority of Russian experts, had no idea uh, that Russians were dissatisfied or the degree to which they were dissatisfied. They thought uh, that the story everyone was telling on the front end was the real story. Uh, and that's a mistake because uh, that may not be the case. Right? So uh, careful with um, buying the propaganda or the the hegemonic discourse, it might just be there because it circulates the best, not because people actually buy it. 
Um, great. So I think that concludes our culture panel. Um, a special thanks to Dr. Schneider, Dr. Mung, and of course, uh, Dr. Berg, who was unable to be here synchronously today. And of course, Dr. Strafello, who um, co-wrote uh, her speech. Um, we're so appreciative of your contributions. Thank you so much for making this a wonderful experience. Um, if anybody in the audience has any more questions, um, I'm sure all of our speakers would be happy to talk to you through email and such, and we can provide you with those after in an email. But uh, yeah, I think that's everything. Thank you guys so much. Um, bye. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Bye. Have a great Bye -bye. weekend.